Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Living and Loving with yours truly, country music artist, singer, songwriter, Monique McCall. And I have an incredible guest for you today, a visionary in media who changed the media landscape forever, an executive from CBS, a founder and CEO of ESPN, if you recognize that name, and the CEO of Univision, along with the owner of BG um, Media, which specializes in the media space, a private equity group, a professor at the New School University in New York City, and a very, very proud father of three children. Please welcome with me here today, Mr. Bill Grimes. How are you? Thank you for that very, very nice introduction, Monica. Monique. I'm fine and it's good to be with you. I'm so happy you could join me on Living and Loving. So how have you been out living and loving? You are Mr. Media. And what's going on in Bill Grimes' world these days? Well, what's it in, the, in my world today, I have transitioned from my media management and executive work to writing stories of my I've completed three volumes. Um, and the, uh, the, and the, with the intention of giving them, leaving them, giving them, which I have not done, to my children who didn't see enough of me when they were young and when I was busy. So now they know all of the, the dirty laundry and, and the clean laundry. So I've tried to tell the story of my life. That's taken me five years to write in three volumes. So this is the Bill Grimes memoir. Is this something that the public can get their hands on or is this for family? I, I, thank you. Well, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, it's nice to contemplate that, but there are a few stories of people who are still a, alive that um, that I I prefer not to have them see. I mean, these are people I've done business with, mm -hmm. which was almost all productive relationship. But there were a couple of stories individual that has deterred me from trying to market this commercially. I don't, you know, I don't need to do that. But I have sent uh, uh, copies to my friends and, of course, the family. That's. That was my target audience. What a beautiful way to leave your legacy for your family and friends. And what a legacy you have in the media world. I mean, you started off as an executive with CBS and then you ended up the founder and CEO of ESPN. Now, now, now I have to correct you there, Monique. I was not the founder. I, re I, I was hired by mm -hmm. the company that bought ESPN from the two founders. So I wasn't the founder, but I came in as and was the, the first president and, and, and was there for eight years. Well, you gotta love media because I uh, did my research. And of course, I guess somebody else made a mistake online. So my apologies for the inaccuracy. So that's, that's, it was a flattering inaccuracy, but <laughs> I had to correct it. I wanna be, I wanna be truthful, so yeah. But the, 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 the point, I, th I think, is still the same. When I was there, ESPN's revenues were a little less than $2 million, and we were losing $15 million a year. So and it, like many startups and like many other cable networks at the time, but a lot of good things happened in the industry. The uh, cable system owners continued to build new cable systems, increase the bandwidth, which enabled more content, more networks to be dis distributed and seen. And uh, so you know, the industry grew with, 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 with help and intellect and expertise from many different people, including your father, who was an, who was an engineer at ESPN. He so, was, he was a 65th employee of ESPN. Was, yeah. So, so again, the, 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 the success of the cable industry, um, which at the time was, was, was technologically and kind of amazing. Now, of course, we've got the internet and we have 
streaming. So we kind of look at cable now is the is the old the old the old kid in town, where the new. But but nonetheless, um, cable now enjoys good economics because of a broadband uh, access uh, through the cable companies, which I don't. I assume we're probably on Comcast now with this with this telecast. Uh, and I know you have seen so many changes over time. What are I mean? What are some of the biggest changes you've seen in your you know, you know, the span of your career uh, in in media? Well, I think one is just the the, uh, the the tremendous increase in programming and content. Uh, you know, there's a there's cable began that with cable be, cable started with twelve channel cable systems, and now of course on your cable, our cable, all cable, where we can get up to a thousand different video channels. So it's been the exponential increase in the number, uh, I, I'd say in the quantity for sure, in the quality of the video content that we're seeing. And now, of course, we're doing something that couldn't have been done 10 years ago. You're, you're in one location, I'm in another, we're looking at each other, we're having this conversation, and millions of people could see it. This, this, this would not have happened 10 years ago. I mean, who would ever thought that the, the Jetsons would come true, right? Do you remember that show? I mean, maybe I'm dating myself here. <laughs> no, no, you couldn't be dating yourself to me. But I don't think I was a, uh, I don't think I, I don't recall that show very much. Okay, it was a show, it was a cartoon about the future. And one of the things was that, you know, they would pick up the phone and they could see each other. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Well, I remember, see, I'm old enough to remember in the Sunday newspaper comic section, which came in color, four color, mm -hmm. there there was a character called Dick Tracy, and he had a watch on, and he wore a watch. This is in the 50s, and the watch turned out to be just like the watches that the Apple makes and you wear, and you could see. One of these. <laughs> One of those, yeah. So the changes, uh, um, you know, continue, and, and uh, much of this, could not have been anticipated 20 years ago. Certainly, in the in, in the streaming and this ability to to video communicate, I guess started with Zoom or whatever. But this is the, these are marvelous tools that uh, that I think is are benefiting all societies and all nations. You know, for even in Africa, we're seeing a lot more. Uh, distribution of, of of information and entertainment through satellite to, to dishes and uh, so there's all it's, it's a very exciting time mm -hmm. to be to be uh, to be aware and a lot it absolutely is and you know um, one of the biggest changes I understand that you made which changed the landscape of media forever was that you were able to get the cable companies to pay you for the programming of ESPN. And this had never been done before, and this changed everything financially for ESPN and other uh, media companies going forward. Yes, that's true. And I'd like to say that it was a stroke of a strategic genius, but the, but the, real, the, real, the, the real reason it happened was unless we could persuade the cable systems to pay us a nickel, a month per subscriber, mm -hmm. you know, with 50 million subscribers, eventually it became real money. And we had, but, and because when I arrived, we were paying the cable operators to carry ESPN. We were paying them like a penny a subscriber and uh, we were losing a lot, $10 million a year. So it was through this mother, what, how's this saying go? The necess mother is the necessity of, how's that go? Something, in other words, you do something smart and good if you really are in trouble financially in, in, in your job. So how did you come up with this idea? I mean, I, I think the term is carriage fees. How did you come up with the idea fees. of carriage fees? Because there was no other way to get any revenue. We were, adver we were advertising supported. We had advertisers, not many, and they weren't spending much. 
So uh, I, the, 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 we needed more money. We needed more income, revenue. Well, there's only, only one other way to do it, get our distributors, the cable companies, to pay us. You know, we're, we're, were you like tossing and turning one night and you were like, ah, oh, you had an aha moment? <laughs> <laughs> My heart was beating and extra. Yeah, it, it took 18 months of visiting probably 40 or 50 of the largest cable companies to finally get them all on board to pay us. And I think it was a nickel a month per subscriber, 60 cents a year. That was our first rate. When I left ESPN, we were up over $3 a month. Per, and they're, they're now at nine. Because when I left, we only had one network, just ESPN. Now, as you know, there's ESPNU, ESPN Classic, ESPN2. There's so, ESPN everything. <laughs> yes. Now, here's one. I, I, I've, I've wondered. How many people know what the E stands for in ESPN? Get out. I, I'm not putting you on the spot because- Is it I entertainment? What? Entertainment? Yes, that's good. Entertainment, entertainment sport. What's and the reason, the reason it was named that, it should have been called the Sports Network. Isn't it Entertainment Sports Programming, Programming Network? Network. Mm -hmm. That's good. You, you have got five stars. Uh, yes. I've asked this question over the years to lots of people I don't know. But the reason that it it, it, it got that title it, with the entertainment uh, in it was because um, the after the founders went broke in, in, in like nine months, mm -hmm. Getty Oil acquired ESPN and, and invested a lot of money mm -hmm. without Getty's support. We wouldn't the ESPN would not be where it is today. But anyway, the executive at Getty, Getty located in, in, in Los Angeles, he was kind of palsy with a lot of the movie studio executives. So he thought someday it would be ESPN would be maybe mean movies and sports programming. But uh, that, that idea was abandoned when Getty got together with two of those studios. I think it was Columbia and, and, and maybe Warner. And they decided to create a competitor to HBO, which HBO is really the first of the cable networks to get distribution. And the, uh, the, uh, uh, the federal government, the antitrust division, determined that that would be too much power. In other words, two studios and a very wealthy oil company would begin to create almost a monopoly on the production of movies. So that failed. And so there, there was never any, by that time, there was no reason to take the E off ESPN because we were getting known well enough and nobody really cared what it meant. But ideally, like, the, like, like uh, MTV, music TV, that was a great one. We should have been sports TV, but... We weren't, <laughs> you know, the idea didn't occur to the original uh, founders. Well, that's uh, interesting because I didn't, I didn't really know, but I always looked at it. Well, you know, sports is entertainment. So I figured that's how it all came together. Yeah. Yeah, you broke up, uh, money just a little bit. Can you? Sure, I said, you know, I thank you for sharing that story because I always thought the entertainment, because I always said, okay, e entertainment, and I wasn't seeing that all of this time as I grew up as a child in ESPN, and I just thought, you know, well, sports is a form of entertainment, so that's probably where they came up with it. That that that, that, that is that is very logical and smart, but it's <laughs> not, it's not the way. It happened, but that you can make a good argument. Certainly, sports is entertainment, but then you might, if you if you thought that, you might say, well, entertainment sports programming network. We don't need both the entertainment and the sports, really. I mean, the, because they're as you point out, they're very much related. Sports is entertainment. So, but anyway, the name we survived the kind of awkwardness of the name, and once we began to get viable live programming, particularly the major sports, then uh, the, then our name really didn't didn't matter. I mean people knew ESPN was was in, was improving its schedule of programming, more live, more exclusive, 
the trick in sports um, to make money is you is is it's it's not only first of all the good thing about sports is it's exclusive unlike news if you're cnn anybody with some money can go out and create murdoch did it with fox so you can do that but with sports the the rights holders the 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 conferences the professional teams will only license a game any game or games to only one provider so you have three channels doing alabama versus florida last week it's on one it's on abc right whereas news you've got five different news channels probably on your cable system so the good thing about sports is is the owners of the sports programming programming the teams the leagues the conferences realize that the best value is to have their games televised on only one channel now sometimes they'll you know the, the national football league has games on abc cbs nbc and fox and espn so but they're never the same game each mm -hmm. of these networks has its own discrete exclusive nfl game so that's kind of the way the good thing about sports is it's exclusive yeah. your gaming is exclusive and nobody can copy it so that's good so I know, you know, ESPN had a lot of hurdles as it began. I remember, you know, my dad worked for NBC Studios and Rockefeller Center, and he went from there to a small little startup company, you know, back in the late 70s, two trailers in the mud with one little satellite dish in Bristol, Connecticut, you know, and as a child, I heard a lot of back talk and, you know, like background talk, not back talk, but background talk, you know, of, of, how things were changing um, through the course of ESPN. And one of the things I remember hearing um, said was that what sort of set ESPN apart as well um, was that they co started covering sports that nobody else was covering, like the America's Cup and, you know, yeah. all uh, much more inconspicuous sports. Yes. Well, th that's an excellent observation. And, and I'll give you the thinking behind it. Um, we had in the early days we were able to get um, a number of conference basketball games so we had a lot of basketball and the basketball got pretty good ratings mm -hmm. but the fellow that uh, that shaped a lot of our thinking who reported it who worked for me who i hired said look we have to give something to everybody so that means we have to have at least an hour a week on skiing on on rowing on kind of you know an hour what program because even though it won't get as good rating it will bring somebody to cable tv to get something they can't get anywhere else so we, we won't get a good rating if we put a, a pick any small sport a horse horse jumping or horse shows right we won't get a good rating but we will get some people who will not be able to see that sport that they love anywhere else this will help the cable systems get new subscribers. Right. And we won't get more ad revenue. Mm -hmm. We could say to the cable systems, you know, you're paying us a nickel now and we're, we're, we're providing more differentiated programming to your subscribers. So pay us more. And that's how we got paid more every year. So was this a change that came under your leadership as well? I would say, yes, I would say I, you know, I didn't wake up one morning and, but 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 we but I began to think about it and uh, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and the the temptation was to do more basketball. We could have gotten basketball from lower from smaller conferences at a very good price that we would pay, and then we'd get good ratings and we could sell probably more advertising. But I th thought that the long the, the bigger picture, the longer the the longer look at this was. We needed to provide something for all, for everybody, for regard for anyone who likes any sport, no matter how small that sport is in terms of popularity. We needed to add, make sure we had some of that. You mentioned the, the biggest success we had in this in this context text was the uh, was the uh, the uh, the sailing in Australia, the the the, yes. the, the, the America's Cup. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, that got us coverage in the New York Times on, I think, even the 
in the first section, certainly in the sports section. But that was really, really innovative because nobody had ever seen America's Cup, which had been around for 100 years. Mm -hmm. No one had ever seen it on television. Mm -hmm. And it was down in Perth, Australia, and we, we worked with Perth, Perth's television production people mm -hmm. who created the picture. We had, a, we had a boat of our own with a couple of our people out that were uh, near the, 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 the sailing boats. But with the cooperation of, of Australian television for the picture, we put our own people on the announce team. And uh, we took, we took um, 30 presidents of cable companies as our guests to Perth, Australia for a week to watch the, uh, to watch the races. We, we hired a, a large yacht, that, and so we were able to get out close to the, the actual boats. So we used that as a way to entertain our best customers and to, uh, and to create something that nobody had ever seen on television, and that, and that was good. And now, do you do you feel as a as CEO at the helm of a big company such as ESPN that you know that's one of the things is that you have to constantly come up with something new, create something new, create an experience. It, that, that's a, that's a driver in what you do. Yes, and, and of course, that's easier to do when the company in the industry is new, because mm -hmm. because you know the more the more participants and the more companies in a business, mm -hmm. the more the more different new things will come up and you can't get them all. So, but you're right. We tried to do something new. I'll give you another example. I hadn't thought of this in a long time. We were the first, to my knowledge, the first television station or network to put crawls, the, 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 the crawls across the bottom of the screen. We would put scores of games in play. ABC, CBS, and NBC, when they televised a college football game, you didn't see any crawls running along the, the bottom of the screen with different scores of games being played. That was something that we did. And initially, the networks laughed at, you know, the three networks. They said, oh, that's, that's these rookies from, it, from ESPN. Nobody, it, it's distractive to the game to look and see scores running below. No, well, it differentiates us. Yes. Then. And then, of course, they copied us after after a while. So they all do it now. But it a, a game changer to the game, right? <laughs> a game changer to certainly to viewing the game and knowing what's happening in other games. And then instead of having to wait for, you know, the, for, for to, to get maybe the score of memory. I think there, there are a lot of little things like that that uh, that, 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 that happen. And and you know when you're when you're new to a market you, you, you do things you can take more chances you can do and uh, because when you're as successful like the three broadcast television networks were not so successful anymore but but it's difficult to change you know things are going good the money's coming in the employees are happy the owners are happy all that's pretty good the problem with that is nothing stays the same for very long. That's so right. unless you're out there in the front and saying, well, gee, what can we do a little different? And companies that aren't motivated to do much different because they're doing well, we were not doing well, so it was easy to try to be different. Well, there, you know, there's always that fear of cha change is good, you go first, right, Bill? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you go first. And, uh, and you're the guy who always went first because I think, yeah. do you attribute a lot of your success to having no fear? <laughs> no, I, 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 I had a lot of fear. I mean, I, I thought, Jesus, we're going to go out of it. Well, I'll tell you that the, I'm going to phrase this correctly, but in terms of fear, yeah, I was always, for a long time, I was worried that we weren't going to be able to succeed. And it would be a terrible thing because we'd hired a lot of people like your dad, you know, and, and a lot of people were depending upon us for management. But the good thing was this, you get an oil company, who, it's just, it's, it's, it's almost unfathomable to me that they invested in this little thing called ESPN. But when we needed money, and I think that the, the, the perhaps, the best thing I did at ESPN 
perhaps, um, is I managed our ownership well. I reported to a senior executive at, at mm -hmm. Oil. He was a difficult person in many ways. Mm -hmm. In many ways, he was very supportive. When we, had, when we had a problem and we needed help, financial help, invariably i would go to los angeles and we'd invariably come back with something that we needed and that means really not that i was such a great salesman but getty took a big a long view of the company and stayed with it and i think the reason they did was being in the oil company in the oil business you drill a lot of holes and you don't get you don't get oil all the time. So they mm -hmm. they they were kind of used to they said, okay, we can we can withstand some failure. But after mm -hmm. year three, when we we're still losing money, mm -hmm. the, the, the pressure began to build on us. And that's when we were able to get the carriage fees that yeah. almost immediately offset the financial mm -hmm. stress we were under. And then we began to hire a lot more people and and uh and again, everything just uh, really grew very well. Very nicely. Well, I'm sure ESPN thanks you and my family thanks you yeah, yeah. for all that you, you brought to sports TV. So you went from sports TV and then you did go to entertainment TV and you yeah. then became the CEO of Univision. And I read... <laughs> Read an interesting fact. Hold that thought because it, it just tickled me that you didn't know really much about Spanish television. You didn't even speak Spanish, but you jumped in there. You were ready to go, and you said, "You know what? I can make this happen." I mean, and and you yeah. did the same with ESPN. You came in there. I mean, at a really difficult time. Um, you know, with difficult hurdles, and you've seemed to overcome all of them. How yeah. is that? Well, it, it, the, the, a, a big part of how we overcame those hurdles was that we had the cable system industry building out more, every town in America was sooner or later getting a cable system. If had that not happened, if the cable operators said, we're not going to go into smaller uh, cities or towns. We're not going to build anymore. We're not making much money. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of money to build a cable system. You know, you've got to, you, have some, you either have to put the the, 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 the the cables underground or you have to string them on telephone poles. And the and, and AT&T sued the cable operators because they, or the, the, the suit was reversed because the phone companies wouldn't let the cable systems initially put the cable wire on their poles because they said they said someday these wires that are delivering cable TV will also be able to deliver telephone calls and we will have a competitor. So they said no initially. Cable industry sued AT&T and this, the Court of Appeals, U.S. Court of Appeals said AT&T, you already have a monopoly in the telephone business. You cannot have a monopoly in the poll business. So somebody, well, you can charge them. Anyway, there's so much of this history, but but the point is a lot of things happened external to ESPN that made ESPN, help make ESPN a success. Whereas in Univision, mm -hmm. it, while the population was growing, we were completely advertising supported. In other words, there were no cables, there were cable systems, but they weren't going to pay anything for, for for it for 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 Univision, mm -hmm. and that's primarily because you know, at the time probably seventy percent of the U.S. Hispanics were living in maybe five markets, five cities. You know, New York, Dallas, Chicago, Los Angeles, maybe San Francisco. So there there weren't that many opportunities to get any kind of additional revenue except what we could get from the over the air broadcast of the of the Univision television stations, which there were 12 or 13 of them. And I did not do such a great job in that job of being the quick quick to 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 um, I, I I came to believe that if we had well when I got to Univision almost all the programming was purchased from Televisa of Mexico. 
Mm -hmm. So that was all good because that was very, very inexpensive. But U.S. advertisers said, you know, this is just, you know, the, the demographics of those people watching repeats of Mexican television, since Mexican Americans, Hispanic uh, Mexicans w was, the, was the largest of the, of the mm -hmm. groups, Puerto Ricans, Cubans. But, but, but anyway, so advertisers said, we're not going to spend money in that, that, that junky program because it's only getting the poorest of the Hispanic people watching it. Mm -hmm. They've seen it. So what I did was I, I spent too much money on new programming. We hired a new staff. We had a, a terrific, uh, we did a, a nightly news. All that cost more money than I thought we could bring in through additional ad revenue. Mm -hmm. it, came, it came too slow. After I left, and, and I didn't, the, 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 it was the, 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 the economics, I did not do a good job of improving it. After I left, what I did, that programming then began to catch on, and more advertisers began to say, yeah, we're going to spend a little money in Spanish language television. And had I been, had I stayed there, in fact, they asked me to leave that job, and I couldn't have disagreed with them. Had I stayed there, I would have made a lot of money, but I didn't. I, I, I had to leave, and it was the right decision. Well, you win some, you lose sure, some. Sure. Did, you, a, did you learn any Spanish while you were there? Uh, no much. <laughs> not much. I had 14, I had, I had 13 station managers, and, the, and the, the, the fellow, the man who ran all of our programming, reporting to me. All of them were Hispanic. All of them spoke perfect English near perfect English. So, you know, I probably would have been more popular in my job had I taken a courses at night and learned a little Spanish. But, uh, but my job wasn't to, you know, my, uh, my job was to, you know, do the finances and bring in advertising. And, and uh, I did some of that, but, but not, not enough. So I give myself a C on that job. <laughs> That's why you get an A at ESPN, a C. Yeah, a C. I'm, a blend, I'm a blended B. <laughs> I'm a B manager. You know, they, they always say, you know, that it's those B and C students that end up really, you know, taking on the big challenges and and taking on the, the leadership roles. So <laughs> you're, you're right where you're supposed to be, Bill. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's true. Well, it's been a wonderful time and great people and uh, you know the, the memories. As I mentioned, I I spent a long time writing the, my memoirs, and and in those memoirs, the, the the chapter on ESPN is one of the longest, and there are I think a lot of wonderful anecdotes of you know mm -hmm. of things that happened with different people mm -hmm. that uh, that really made the experience much richer. You know the, the in, in in a, in, a, in a psychic way. It was, it was very gratifying to see somebody do better in their job or to promote somebody mm -hmm. or to all that, all that stuff is, uh, is, is, is important because mm -hmm. while I was motivated by money, I wasn't motivated as, as a lot of people are to make money. And I probably could have made more, but I, uh, I you know. So what I, motivated you? Well, I, I, I enjoyed the I enjoyed the money, so that was pretty good. You know, so that was okay. But what what, what really motivated me was um, the feeling that I was a leader. I liked that, and I liked the affiliation that I had with the people that that I worked most closely with. Yeah. You know, and I had five or six people at, at ESPN reporting to me, and got to know them all well. We were in meetings. We spent a lot of time mm -hmm. together. And, and so it, the affiliation with like-minded people who are working with towards the same goal as you are, mm -hmm. i.e., we're going to make this company better, mm -hmm. and we're going to have a good time doing it because I think we like each other. Let's prove it that we like each other and that we can disagree. Mm -hmm. And uh, I often felt that I was the, the the least informed person in the room. Mm -hmm. um, in a way, because I was the president as the general manager, you have to know a little bit about everything. But 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 the point is, 
I just tried to always hire people that I thought were smarter than I than I was. I had an interview, interviewed somebody, and the and the, and the person showed independent thinking, maybe not totally sucking up, you know. And mm -hmm. I would say this is the kind of person that I would tend to, to like to hire, uh, mm -hmm. uh, because the, the big companies today, or most big companies, or certainly companies that are growing quickly, need to get a lot of good, valuable, honest input from people. Mm -hmm. It's easy if you're the president and somebody comes in and says, oh, this is really going well, but that's a great, great decision. That, that, that is a dangerous, one. Well, that's a seductive part of being the boss. In so so do you feel that, you know, the emotional drivers are as important as the intellectual yeah. drivers? Yeah. Yeah, it's a hard thing to say as important, uh, but certainly um, to have they have both ego and empathy in the in the CEO, and, and um, is 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 important, uh, uh, and and so I would say those are on the more the emotional side rather than the strategic strategic mm -hmm. business side, but. It certainly is important to have empathy and to be strong enough to, to fire people. And I had to do a lot of that at ESPN in the, in the first couple of years. And I know a lot of people view the word ego as a negative term, but um, in the way you're speaking about it, there's a lot of positive that does go into yeah. ego, especially yeah. from a leadership perspective. Yeah, then that's a good, very good observation. And I should clarify that. Yeah, by ego, I mean not the chest thumping that I'm the boss and I'm smart. Ego to me in, in my, the context that I mentioned it means the ability to have enough belief in yourself to make a hard decision, which, which likely is not unanimously agreed upon mm -hmm. by the people in the company. So that's what I mean about ego. You need to be able to be strong enough to go against the tide, even of your own people, occasionally, and I had good people. So that's what I mean. Not like, oh, good, I'm, I'm Mr. President. No, <laughs> no, exactly. You know, because um, I've heard the acronym used for ego, which uh, it means edging God out. Yeah, the, no, I did. You broke up just a little bit. The, I heard the acronym for. The, I've heard other leaders use the acronym yeah. of ego as edging God out. So that's why I said, you know, sometimes it can come across uh, as a negative thing, but the way that you're saying it is you've got yes. to have the strength to go against the tide, which is very, very yeah. different. Yeah. And very, and very, and if you've got really good people and things are going well, mm -hmm. you don't go against the tide often. The, the only, the, the only time we had a really a serious dispute, um, was the fellow that I had hired um, uh, who came up with a lot of our strategy. We, we were discussing, we, we, the, the reality was we had to go to the cable operators and ask them for money, had to do mm -hmm. it. His belief, that I, he, I, he, he was from uh, McKinsey and he was an MBA and he was really smart. His, belief, his, his, his point was built, let's wait six more months. We will have some new programming our argument to the cable operators for money will be strengthened because we'll be better. And I said to him, his name was Roger Warner, it's a wonderful person. I said, Roger, I said, I, you're right that it would be better, but I'm beginning to feel a lot of pressure from getting oil that you're not feeling. And I said, I know it's going to be tougher if we go out tomorrow, announce this tomorrow and go out. We had a long we had a long discussion. I remember that it, it, we started in the afternoon and we were still talking in nightfall up in Bristol. And uh, so I finally had to say, Roger, you know, I have to make this decision, and I know you'll do your best because it was his job to be the front man with the cable operators. And I was in the front. But so that was the only time that I really had to do, and that's what I mean by ego. It wasn't. I acknowledge that, yes, it would be better to wait, but Getty Oil could turn off the pump any time. And, I, and I'm, I'm the one that knows better than you. That wouldn't be their first time turning off the pumps. So. <laughs> yes.
or di or digging a dry hole like the, like ESPN was appearing to be. But yeah, so. So you he, felt so strongly about it. Did you know yeah. that it was going to work? Th did I know it was going to work? Um, no, I didn't know, but I believed that it would. I believed that it would. Now, and did that belief come intellectually or yeah, did that just yeah. come somewhere from deep within? Yeah, no, here, here is the intellectual rationale for the belief. Mm -hmm. We told the cable operators, if you begin to pay us, mm -hmm. we will commit. We can't do it in money yet because we don't know what the money will be. We will commit to get better and more programming. Better and more programming on ESPN mm -hmm. will help you get more cable subscribers because at that time, only about one in two and one or maybe three mm -hmm. people who could subscribe to cable subscribed because there wasn't enough unusual, unique mm -hmm. programming. So we said to the cable operators, one, pay us. We will invest a lot of that money in better programming. Therefore, you will not only get more subscribers, you'll get more viewership and you can sell local advertising. Mm -hmm. None of them were selling local advertising. Okay. So this was a very important thing. It's a new a revenue source. Huh? A new revenue source for them. Yes, a new revenue source for the cable operator. <laughs> they were aware of it, but most of the cable operators were people from uh, from engineering and finance. Mm -hmm. And so they knew there was something out there called advertising, but advertising was for radio and TV, blah, blah, blah. But we said to them, no, you can do it. And then we would get the with the, the estimated revenues in every in every TV market. Mm -hmm. So if we went to a cable system in in any Chicago, New York, anywhere, we would go in and say, You you gotta get into selling local advertising. We can help you. We hired somebody to go help you. But anyway, we would say, you know that in your market, Mr. Cable Operator, let's say it's Des Moines, Iowa, in this market, there are three TV stations that are generating $50 million in TV advertising. You're getting none of that. What if you get 1% of that because you can sell commercials within ESPN, CNN, MTV, You've got the world right there in your hands. You've got to hire advertising people. And they began to okay. do that. So that was part of the intellectual. Pay us. This is your gonna this is your return on paying us. You're gonna do really well. And we believed it and we convinced them. the the key the key uh, uh, the cable system uh, owners and uh, and, it, and, it, and it, it obviously it worked. It was so it took a lot of strength and, and conviction in your beliefs. It took a lot of that because the first couple of uh, calls that I made, we made the cable company to, to give them the happy news that that we're not going to pay them a penny a subscriber <laughs> anymore, but, but you're going to pay us a, a nickel. That's what we want. So it's, there, not, there are a lot of no you pardon? You found a way to give back. You got. You found a give back for them, which is always important in a transaction. We, we, we were trying to say, you. This will be profitable for you. Mm -hmm. Pay us. You'll make more money. Um, but the first, the first call I made was uh, to the, the to the president of the Time Warner came in New York. So he listened to this pitch. He said, "I'll tell you, Grimes. He said, I don't know you, but." Uh, I'm speaking for Time Warner Cable, which was maybe the third or fourth largest one. He says, look at me. We will never pay you a penny. You started your business on advertising. You didn't start it to come to us and beg for money. You've got a very wealthy owner called Getty Oil. Mm -hmm. We will never pay you a penny. And he took his finger and he pointed his finger at me yeah. in a nice way. Well, it was it was a, a silent on my part, great pleasure. When a year later, Time Warner signed it at a nickel for the first year, and we were getting like twenty percent in the four-year contract. So, so there was a lot of you know nobody wants to pay for something that they were getting free. So yeah, you know, I understood that. So we made our best effort with what I told you. The, now that they would get a, a good return on it, and and, and um, why do you think why do you think they were finally accepting of it? Well, I'll tell you here. Uh, I thought about that a lot, and uh, 
I, I, there, there are a couple of reasons, and it's a really a very important question in thinking about the business. One, there were a number of CEOs of large cable companies who had pretty good foresight. Two, CBS had started a cable channel about a year and a half ago with a lot of fanfare. It's going to be kind of like HBO. It's going to kind of be, kind of be like CBS. And after like 13 months, CBS called it quits, canceled the, 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 the network, the cable network it started. The cable industry stocks, the public company stocks, all lost about five to 10% of their value the same day. Because what Wall Street looked at was, well, if CBS can't make money selling their programming to cable okay. TV, then no one's going to make any money. And this business is good. So because of that, I think the cable companies took another thought about us and said, you know, ESPN may not be really great now, but if they go out of business, and I would sometimes say, you know, I'm, I'm – I, I report to Getty, Getty's got a lot of money, you're right. Mm -hmm. But they've already dumped 50 million into this thing called ESPN and they don't, their patience is not ever enduring. So, yeah. so that also helped that, 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 the fact that CBS, the, with all this, I mean, you, you, you undoubtedly, you were too young to remember, but, but CBS announced we are going into the cable. We're going to create the greatest cable network. It's going to be like better than HBO, blah, blah. And all the cable operators said, oh, yes, good CBS. They, CBS didn't ask for any money from the mm -hmm. cable operators, but they all did. And then after just 13 months, mm -hmm. CBS announced one day, boom, closing up, no more, cable, no more. I forget what it was called, even, like CBS. I, I forget. But that shook the, the stock markets. And most of the cable operators, more and more of the big cable companies, or virtually now all of them were public companies. So their stock was being traded. CBS, a program supplier, is gone. ESPN's not doing very good. Turner is in debt, borrowing money to buy the studio and to, to buy MGM. So he's about broke. Well, the cable companies can't do much if they don't have any programming. So <laughs> that, 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 that's that 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 that's for sure. So I guess I, I guess them giving back as well is important, and I think giving back in general in business and in life is important. So how important is giving back to you? I'm sure you were involved in giving back so much in uh, charitable ways as well throughout your career. Well, are you talking about a corporate char charitable? I'm charitable? even talking personally. I mean, what what um, you know what moves you? What drives you? Oh, to give back? Well, you know, just um, it. it, it work is fun if you like what you're doing. And I, I liked what I was doing. And as you I undoubtedly know in your career, the very diverse career, writing and singing, entertaining, the more you do it, usually you get better. So as mm -hmm. you get better, it becomes even more fun, doesn't it? Don't you think? Absolutely. Yeah. And the harder you work, the luckier you get, right? The harder you work, the luckier you get. That is so for, which, that for sure. Which organizations do, have you been involved with in giving back? Oh, gee, well, um, after uh, after Univision, I had one more corporate job. And then I and then I took about three three years where I where I sat on boards of startup companies. Uh, very few did really well, uh, but a couple did, uh, and and I and I was lucky enough to have a little money to invest in companies like TJ's, right. and, and that was a, a lot. So, but what I did mostly was I was kind of a selective consultant. Mm -hmm. Who, to, uh, who at one one time I was on maybe four or five boards of of mostly <laughs> startup companies, and so. So that was fun, and and that provided, you know, a nice living, and and I felt that I was contributing to the people um, with something I had learned that they had not yet learned. That, that, so that that was part of my. You mentioned I, I I taught a class in New York for for ten years in, in mm -hmm. media economics. So being able to give back to help people that are starting and sharing and, the knowledge, sharing the yeah, knowledge. 
say, yeah, well, we tried that, and but, but you know, maybe it'll work for you. Times have changed, but that that that's good. That was that was good. That was fun giving back. If, if giving back should be giving back should be really fun because you're doing something for someone else. You know? Absolutely, and that's what we're ultimately. That's what we're here to do. That, that's what we're here to do, and I just hope we can do a little better than we've been doing in in our country in our world of late. I absolutely agree because we're here to live and love, hence the title yeah, of the living, show. Living and loving, I like that, yeah. And I have a couple more questions for yeah. you before yeah. I let you go. Yeah. Um, you have been a visionary. You predicted the change in the newspaper industry uh, 12 years before it happened. And there's so much change happening in the world now. Can you predict what's going to happen in the media industry going forward? Well, first of all, when you think when I think media, I think content, there's two different kinds of content. There's information and entertainment, information being more news and information. And uh, so I think now that that we I don't see any decrease in this tremendous increase in content, both entertainment and information, depending on how you want to. Uh, 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 so so the, the, the challenge I think is going to be, how are these companies going to continue to, to fund new, unique, exclusive, attractive programming, content, information, with more and more and more companies sharing in the revenues. Mm -hmm. Just for example, um, you know, I, I spent my first number of years in radio, and, to, it, and it, it's, it's been maybe 10 years now, at least eight or 10 years now, since Google has generated more advertising than all of the United States' 1,400 radio stations. Wow. Now that's, that's, a, that's very close to the number. That's, that's mm -hmm. my point. But, but so this, this, this suggests to me what is going to happen that we've already seen it begun with newspapers. Radios, the radio industry is very weak now. Again, yeah. Google and Facebook, mm -hmm. all, these, all, the, all the advertisers are moving over to, you know, to, to, to digital and to the online, these, these giants. And now you've got somebody like Amazon who's figured out how to get into advertising too. Okay. So they're going to, the advertising pie is, is big. I forget the number in the United States now, but I, I don't know, maybe three, four billion, maybe more, I can't remember, but it, it's big. It's growing a little bit, maybe one to two to 3% a year, but you have these new entrants, these new competitors dipping into that pie. So you, you look at CBS and, and MTV and all the traditional ones, and they are losing share of advertising every day. And uh, I'm, well, the programming world is very oversaturated. Oversaturated, and you have these the 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 the, the, the big tech companies, Amazon and YouTube or, or Facebook. They have they 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 can spend a lot of money on program. Well, take like Netflix is a wonderful example. That you know, 12, 10, fifteen years ago, Netflix came to you on a little disc, and that was great. Now Netflix and Amazon are spending more money on original movies mm -hmm. and series than the three television networks combined. Now, just already. So imagine what the impact is. That is the impact on traditional media, traditional media, including television, broadcast television, mm -hmm. is is going to be negative. Uh, I don't see, I just see more consolidations. Like I think we'll see CBS and NBC merge together. I think mm -hmm. the government will let it because now all the money, the ad money's not going in their pockets so much. So I think we're gonna see all kinds of changes like that, new ownership, uh, um, uh, and, and but in, in it, it, I hate to do this hackneyed 
expression. But at the end of the day, mm -hmm. it's going to be the quality, the originality, the exclusivity of the content. What you see on the screen, mm -hmm. see on the paper, or hear in your ears, it's going to be the quality that will win. The trick is mm -hmm. to make good quality stuff, information, entertainment, programming is costing more and more and more. Mm -hmm. In part because you've got three or four wealthy companies out there at Amazon mm -hmm. who just say, you know, okay, CBS paid $3 million for, uh, mm -hmm. for uh, uh, an hour of programming. Well, Amazon said, we, we could do that stuff. We can do it better. We'll pay five. So mm -hmm. the directors, the creative people are now being drawn in to these new entrants, entrants in the mm -hmm. entertainment business. So it all goes, you know, radio once was a giant. When I was a kid, I used to sit around with my grandparents and listen to the radio. We'd all sit, listen. Then TV came, radio diminished quite a bit. Moving around the antenna, putting aluminum foil on it. <laughs> yeah. So, so we, if you look at the evolution of how once leaders blessed by uh, technology and finance became wonderful industries, radio, broadcast TV, cable TV, and now it's all just kind of moving in new directions. So it's good for creative people because there are more outlets and there are more ways to get it. But, but that also poses the, 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 the challenge of with more voices out there in, the, in here, um, the, you, you, the competition is harder, which for the consumer is good. The more competition for mm -hmm. great singers and great songwriters, the more the consumer benefits, you know? Uh, so. So you just have to stay as, as close to the top of your game and, and, uh, and cross your fingers and go for it. So. That's great advice. So before I let you go, I have one more question yes, for you. Not, yes, I, I'm loving it, you can tell. <laughs> I'm living and loving the conversation. I'm yeah. so happy you're living and loving with me today. This is such a gift. So I always ask all of my guests one question. Uh, before I let them go. And as a singer songwriter, I always like to know what is the one song that speaks to your heart and sums up the essence of your being? I just thought about that. It's a song that was a doo song in the 50s by a group called the Harp Toads. And the, the name of the song is Life is But a Dream. And okay. it's, 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 it's more philosophical than, you know, are we? Are we really here? Are, are, are we part of a, a bigger scheme? Is there a multi-universe? Mm -hmm. But the song is beautifully sung with, uh, with just a, a great uh, 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 melody and, and you know all that ooh, ooh all that old stuff. But it, 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 is, it is basically asking the question, is everything we've doing, is it, are we kind of in a dream world? Is this real? And, and so that's, that's a, that's a song that uh, that I listen to, you know, maybe once or twice a week just to think about the, the word. Uh, <laughs> and it's so true. Life is but a dream. Yes. You know, yeah. we're not really sure. Some days I feel the same way. I'm like, is this all some sort of funny joke? <laughs> yes. And yeah, there have been times when I, I thought, gee, you know, this is such a, a stressful situation. Maybe I'm dreaming. I can just wake up. This was just all a moment. <laughs> well, but anyway, life, is, life has been a good dream. Too. It has been a good dream yeah. and it continues to be a yeah. good dream. Live in that dream state. So I really thought you were going to say that Country Road, being a West Virginia boy, yeah. that Country Road was going to be your song. Yeah. Well, do you, do you know why it wasn't? Why? Because I lived in the largest city in Wheeling and it was 50 miles in West Virginia. It was 50 miles south of pittsburgh uh -huh. so so way up north so in so all of those roads those wonderful roads and the hollows and the yeah you know, they 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 were all far away it'd be like a different okay so, but i still like the song it was mountain mama i like that i that that, that thought 
It definitely is a great song, but Life is But a Dream is also another like great it. song, another I'll, great I'll, message. I'll send you the link on it, and, 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 you can, and you may want to take a look. It's a short song, but it's just, it's really, it, it created, creates a lot of thought when I think, when I listen to it. And it's nice to listen to. It's, you know, it's, it's a group of four uh, African Americans, I'll say now, black guys then, who just, just harmonize so well on the song. With one, you know, with one lead singer, but the background of the three other guys is is just perfect. Anyway, I'm looking forward to that link. So thank you so <laughs> much for yeah. joining me today, yeah. Yeah. Mr. Bill yeah. Grimes. You are fantastic. You have had such a, a fantastic career. So much more ahead for you. Hope that I'll become good enough friends with you that you'll share those three wonderful books that you've written with me. I don't know what I have to do to twist your arm to get a copy, but uh, I know there's probably so many lessons in leadership. So thank you for joining me today on Living and Loving again. Um, hey, everyone. It's Monique McCall, country music singer, songwriter, recording artist. Uh, so happy that I could be here and live in love with you in the words of Mr. Bill Grimes. Have the strength to go against the tide, have empathy, and remember, life is but a dream. <laughs> Get out, live, love, love you all. Have a blessed day. Thank love. you. Thank you, Monique. The question is great. Right. Thank you Good so luck. much, Phil. All right. Bye. 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 You take me back.